so today we're going to be doing the current affairs uh, for today as well as some of the topics again from yesterday which are again a little important inflation this is a persistent problem for india it had been a big problem between uh, 2008 till 2015 in the recent years from 2015 till 2019 onwards inflation was in control to an extent but since 2020 onwards we've been seeing that inflation has become again a little bit of a problem apart from that we see a continuation of the government's policy government bans 54 uh, new chinese mobile apps the government has recently banned uh, even last year uh, chinese mobile apps now the number has reached to more than 200 mobile apps which have been banned uh, rajasthan to begin riverbed sand mining again also there was the swearing in ceremony of the chief justice of the madras high court this is not a very important topic from dynamic content but rather it's an important topic from a static content perspective and then convention of the cms this is an extremely extremely important topic again it is important from dynamic perspective as well as static perspective loss of fever not so important but we shall discuss it inflation edges past 6% in january now what is this inflation that we are talking about again as we had discussed before inflation is nothing but the rise in the prices of goods and services rise in prices of goods and services normally inflation is compared with respect to a base as compared to that base how much has the inflation currently risen now india's retail inflation accelerated past the 6% mark in january to hit 6.01% breaching the central bank's tolerance threshold for consumer price inflation for the first time since june 2021 now we can see that the retail inflation please remember it's the retail inflation that has increased beyond 6% not the wholesale inflation there is a difference between retail inflation and wholesale inflation now retail inflation is what is shown in the consumer price index and wholesale inflation is what is shown in the wpi wholesale price index now retail inflation works at the customer level it works at the retailer level so it is more important and it denotes the uh, current situation from the consumer perspective while wholesale price index denotes the price rise from the perspective of the aggregator from the perspective of the seller from the perspective of the middleman those who deal in bulk that is the difference between wholesale price index and consumer price index consumer price index is retail inflation now as you know that we had discussed about this earlier the monetary policy committee the mpc of the rbi has certain targets it has to ensure that the inflation level lies between 4 plus or minus 2% Four plus or two minus flow uh, four plus or minus two percent, which means that inflation should always be lesser than six percent and should always be greater than two percent. Inflation is also good for the economy. Why? Because it increases demand for goods. It shows that there is a demand for goods. Hmm. Greater inflation means there is greater price. There is. a greater amount of uh, consumption by public and hence the suppliers will also be enthusiastic about producing more this results in growth 
Hence, inflation is also good for the economy. At the same time, extremely high inflation is bad for the economy because it means that the items of daily usage are becoming more and more expensive. Now, we shall uh, discuss more about the news. Food inflation is high mainly due to the higher edible oils component. But the overall basket is below the headline number at 5.6%. Now, food inflation they are saying is at 5.6%. While the headline number, what is the headline inflation? Headline inflation comprises the total inflation of all the goods. It includes food, it includes fuel, it includes minerals, it includes travel, it includes all the components, housing, everything. While its opposite is core inflation. Core inflation does not include components such as food and fuel which are highly volatile substances and which are not under the control of the monetary policy committee usually. So this is the difference between head, headline inflation and core inflation. According to the news article, the headline inflation is at 6.01% while the food inflation is at 5.6%. The food inflation is actually lower than the headline inflation. Moving on. Rural India bore the brunt of the inflation spike as per official data while inflation in urban India was virtually unchanged. So the article suggests that rural areas had higher inflation as compared to urban India for the month of January. Now this is a matter of concern. Why? Because India's population dynamics are such that Rural India comprises of about 70% of India's population while urban India only comprises of 30% of population according to census 2011. This is the new census year. So the census will also be published uh, in the coming few months. So we'll have to go through the census also once it's published. So, until then, you keep referring to the census 2011 document. With global crude oil prices now hitting $95 a bar barrel, economics, economists said that the government stance on retail fuel prices, whether to increase them or to reduce excise duties, will determine the trajectory of inflation. Okay. Please remember that we do not have a GST component for petrol and diesel rather we still have excise duties when it comes to petrol center has so when it comes to petrol center has its own excise duties and states have their own excise duties both have excise and because of these excise duties that both of them levy, the prices of petrol have been high. Also apart from this, there is also a crisis in the OPEC. What is the OPEC? OPEC is the oil producing and exporting countries. These are responsible for major production of crude oil and it is from crude oil that we get petrol, diesel, naphtha, air turbine fuel, resins, polymers, etc. So OPEC is responsible for production of most of the crude oil. Hence, if OPEC reduces the number of barrels of crude oil that are being produced, what happens? The price of crude oil will increase. If the price of crude oil increases, automatically the price of petrol will also increase. So the barrel of crude oil is hitting $95 and this is a problem. Apart from this, we also see that Russia, which is another major producer, has been busy in trying to occupy Ukraine. It is preparing for a war with Ukraine. 
and is Russia attacks Ukraine, the global crude oil prices would be expected to increase much further higher and it will be a problem. Apart from this, Venezuela has sanctions, American sanctions and so no one can purchase crude oil from Venezuela which causes a problem of a shortage. Iran is under CATSA countering America's adversaries through sanctions act and hence countries like India cannot even purchase from Iran. So because of all these problems there is a dip in the global crude oil production. Also during Corona period, a lot of the major players had to cut down on their oil production because there were no users, there was no supply, there was no demand for oil. And because of that, most of the OPEC countries started reducing their production of crude oil. And now they cannot spike it up all of a sudden. It has to be a gradual process. And that is the reason why the global crude oil prices have been very high. Uh, we have discussed all of this. The ongoing Ukraine crisis is likely to escalate the international crude oil prices higher. Hence, the central government may have to lower the excise duties. Unless and until the central government and the state governments reduce their excise duties, the prices of petrol will not reduce. And if the price of petrol does not reduce, inflation will not reduce. Why? Because petrol is a component, fuel is a component of consumer price inflation. Consumer price index, I'm sorry. Apart from that, clothing and footwear inflation accelerated to 8.84% in January from 8.3% in December. Following the introduction of higher GST rate on footwear products. This is one uh, reason why inflation has increased. There is high 6% plus inflation in non-food segments like clothing, fuel and lighting, household goods, health, Transport, communication, recreation. Now, consumer price index. I am sure you know what consumer price index is by now. Uh, the consumer price index components are majorly food and beverages. They make up about 45% of consumer price index. You have the consumer price index basket. Now in this basket, food makes up about 45%, while services makes up about 21% and housing makes up about 10%. Find out what are the other components of this consumer price index basket. Apart from this, WPI, wholesale price index. Find out what are the components of the wholesale price index. Over here, what would be the major component? It would be manufactured products not food or primary articles manufactured products would be the major why because uh, the WPA wholesale price index deals with bulk goods it deals with wholesale products this makes up about 60 percent and also this does not include any services while the consumer price index includes services. We earlier we discussed headline inflation and core inflation. Headline inflation is the inflation figure arrived based on all of the above components of CPI. It includes everything. Food and beverages, services, housing, transport, clothing, footwear, all of them. While core inflation is headline inflation minus the inflation in food and energy. Energy means fuel. So, core inflation is nothing but headline inflation minus these things. Food, inflation in food and inflation in fuel. Why? Why do we need core inflation? We need core inflation because food and fuel prices are transitory. They are not permanent mainly supply driven and therefore can't be controlled by RBI's monetary policy tools. They are not dependent upon the actions taken by India. They are out of the hands of uh, the government. Say for example food. It depends upon the monsoon. 
which is not under the control of the government energy fuel it depends upon international actions and hence not dependent upon what the government does and they are transitory they keep changing very often they are very volatile and hence they are usually taken out so what does the government need to do in order to fight inflation steps can be taken by different uh, players now over here the rbi has to follow a separate policy in order to reduce the liquidity reduce what is liquidity liquidity is the excess amount of money in the circulation to reduce liquidity the rbi has to follow a tight money policy or a dear money policy or a hawkish stance now what are these things whenever we spoke about the monetary policy committee it has three particular stances that it can take one is accommodative neutral calibrated tightening now calib so whenever the rbi takes a tight dear or hawkish monetary policy it goes for calibrated tightening which means that it increases the interest rates what happens when it increases the interest rates the number of people who will be taking loans if it increases the repo rate the banks will also have to borrow at a higher interest rates and also people who are borrowing from banks because the banks have to pay higher interest rates to rbi even they will also be charged a higher interest rate hence the borrowing will reduce and hence the amount of money in circulation will reduce so that is the idea of a tight dear hawkish money monetary policy so there will be lesser borrowing and there will be lesser money in circulation also the central government take, can take several steps like tax deduction exemption subsidy benefits towards producers to decrease the cost of production if the cost of production is reduced then the uh, people who are producing they will produce more if they produce more if there is more supply and uh, if it starts matching the demand then automatically inflation will start reducing the inflation occurs only when the supply is not able to match the demand there are too there is too much of money chasing too few goods that is when inflation arises however when you increase the supply there will be enough amount of demand and there will be enough amount of supply also automatically inflation reduces reducing the fiscal deficit fiscal deficit is the spending of the government so when you reduce the spending of the government automatically there will be lesser money in the circulation uh, subsequent points are also very simple you can understand it government bans 54 new apps new chinese mobile apps the center on monday banned over 50 new chinese mobile applications following up on an earlier ban of chinese mobile apps the center banned these apps citing concerns over privacy and national security by invoking its power under section 69a of the information technology act now section 69a of the it act it gives special powers to the central government to be able to ban certain apps or ban uh, uh, websites which are against the morality which are against the integrity and unity of the country which affect which affect the uh, which affect the public order you know like you have these common trends if they get affected the center can ban those particular apps red with relevant provisions of the information technology procedure and safeguards for blocking of access of information by public rules 2009 under these two the government has banned these particular apps now more on the news ministry of electronics and information technology had issued interim directions for blocking 54 apps sources said 
adding that these were allegedly collecting sensitive user data. Please do read about the government's data protection law. With this, you will understand what sensitive uh, personal data is, what critical data is and what normal data is, which were being misused and transmitted to servers outside India. So sensitive user data cannot be sent outside India under the draft data protection law. It's draft because it's still not passed and it's not uh, valid right now. The government had last year banned over 200 Chinese mobile applications, including popular ones such as TikTok, Share It, uh, Club Factory, Cam Scanner, etc. Why do we need to ban these apps? The government had received many complaints from various sources, including several reports about misuse of some mobile apps available on Android and iOS platforms for stealing and transmitting users' data in an unauthorized manner to servers which have locations outside India. You cannot send sensitive personal data outside India. The compilation of these data, its mining and profiling by elements hostile to national security and defense of India, which ultimately impinges upon the sovereignty and integrity of India, is a matter of very deep and immediate concern which requires emergency measures. Now, mining of data means making sense of that data. When we have huge amount of data, then we use data analytics, we use data mining to make sense of that data and to draw certain patterns from that data and using that using those patterns these uh, you know this data can be used to compromise on privacy of individuals privacy of organizations and hence uh, the government had to take these uh, steps so that the sovereignty and integrity of india is safeguarded the Indian Cyber Crime Coordination Center under the Ministry of Home Affairs has also sent an exhaustive recommendation for blocking these apps please read what are the different cyber coordination uh, cyber coordination centers which are existing we have a national uh, cyber crime coordination center we have an indian cyber crime coordination center find out under which ministries these work i will give you some of them cert in please read which ministry and what body is this is this a statutory body executive body constitutional body autonomous body which what type of body is this and then you have uh, indian cyber crime coordination center and then you have national cyber crime coordination center and then you have cyber swachhata kendra So all these exist and you have to see under which ministry they lie. All of them are not under Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. They are also under Ministry of Home Affairs. Rajasthan to begin river bed sand mining. What type of a mineral is sand? Is it a major mineral or is it a minor mineral? It is a minor mineral. Now, environmental clearance issued to as many as 60 mining areas has paved the way for legal mining of riverbed sand in Rajasthan more than four years after the Supreme Court banned it. Now, background. Availability of legally mined riverbed sand which is mixed with cement for construction of buildings had drastically reduced after the Supreme Court's order. Supreme Court banned it Again, demand supply mismatch. And hence, there was huge amount of demand for uh, riverbed sand. And because of this, mining mafia had uh, come up to illegally produce sand and sell it. And the huge gap in demand and supply also led to delay and closure of several construction projects. In November last year, the Supreme Court accepted the Central Empowered Committee's recommendations permitting riverbed sand mining to be conducted after obtaining all statutory clearances and payment of applicable taxes. 
uh, all statutory clearances these have to be usually given by the ministry of environment forests and climate change problems of riverbed sand mining sand mining damages the ecosystem of rivers destroys natural habitat of organisms living on riverbeds and affects fish breeding and migration when you mine uh, the sand which is found on the riverbeds automatically it destroys the ecosystem of rivers it destroys those hatcheries it affects the safety of bridges and physical structures in the region say for example there are culverts and there are small check dams automatically sand mining affects their stability it affects the stability of the bridges it can cause tremors mining also increases saline water in the rivers when you drill through the uh, river bed it results in several minerals which are not needed coming out and polluting the river water it increases the salinity of the river water thus lack of enforcement for sand mining regulations and insufficient subsidy programs for affected communities detrimentally impact coastal welfare see when we don't have sufficient sand mining regulations the supreme court had banned it however there was illegal mafia which was operating in many states now that affects the coastal uh, welfare of people who are living in and around those rivers in and around those uh, seas because there aren't any uh, sufficient i mean even though there are uh, there is a ban that exists there is still illegal sand mining and hence even the government can't you know take steps to be able to protect the people because it's illegally happening the sand mafia a network of criminal syndicates that illegally mine sand has proven especially destructive with attempts to curtail their behavior often leading to violent results it is leading to gangs gang wars deaths in fact beaches dunes and sandbanks they act as barriers for rivers and uh, they prevent from they prevent flooding from occurring however when you mine these places off what happens is that it results in flooding of the nearby regions also whenever you do sand mining there is also more problem of siltation dams are covered in silt this reduces the capacity of the dam to hold sufficient level of water when there is more silt more silt dam can't hold sufficient amount of water there is more silt hence dam can hold only hold lesser amount of water and because it can hold only lesser amount of water its ability to uh, generate hydroelectricity also reduces so there are several problems also sand mining destroys the aesthetic beauty of beaches and river banks and because of that tourism gets affected a recent study of the world wildlife fund world worldwide fund for nature uh, okay shows mining is responsible for 90% drop in sediment levels in major asian rivers including the ganges brahmaputra meghna mekong and yangtze this results in shrinking of the deltas when deltas reduce automatically the fertile regions deltas are fertile regions for plant growth so when deltas reduce automatically the production in these regions reduces leaving local people extremely vulnerable to floods land loss contaminated drinking water and crop damage so several problems exist because of riverbed sand mining this is an important topic because it has been happening time and over again and uh, even several steps by different governments has not yielded sufficient results swearing in ceremony of chief justice of madras high court now uh the tamil nadu governor administered the oath of office to the madras high court chief justice now 
who appoints the uh, chief justice or the judges of a high court is it the governor no it's not it is the president of india it's a president who appoints them but it is usually the governor who administers the oath to these judges according to article 217 the judge of high court shall be appointed by the president in consultation with the chief justice of india and the state governor if it is for a common high court then the governors of all the concerned state high courts are consulted in the case of appointment of a judge other than the chief justice the chief justice of the particular high court is also consulted so this is how the appointment happens now when uh, the president is consulting the chief justice of india how does it work now the chief justice of india for, uh, he frames a collegium now this collegium generally consists of the chief justice of india and the four senior most judges when it comes to appointment of judges of the high court the chief justice of india acts along with two senior most judges there's four senior most judges exists for affairs of the supreme court for elevating judges to the supreme court for transferring uh, judges for that you have the chief justice of india acting along with the four senior most judges while for appointment of judges to the high court you have the chief justice of india acting along with the two senior most judges and that is the collegium for high court judges now in case of appointment of judges to the high court it was opined that the chief justice of india should consult a collegium of two senior most judges of the supreme court before recommending a name to the president of india in the seminal third judges case okay so this collegium concept actually came up only in the third judges case what are the judges cases now in the first judges case first judges case which is straight it again uh okay the judges cases are different cases which are which are uh, which decided the independence of the judiciary in india the first judge case known as sp gupta versus union of india in this case sp gupta versus union of india in this particular case it was decided that uh the consultation done by president need not be concurrence which means that the opinion given by the chief justice of india regarding who shall succeed him or who shall be appointed to the supreme court need not be binding on the president however this changed in the second judges case this is the first judges case and then we had the second judges case supreme court advocates on record versus union of india in this case it was decided that consultation is nothing but concurrence so when the president of india consults the chief justice of india the advice tendered by the chief justice of india is binding on the president so whatever advice is given by the chief justice of india has to be followed and implemented by the president of india now in the third judges case which was on the basis of a presidential which was based on the presidential questioning under article 143 of the constitution 
it is based on the advisory jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. The President can actually consult the Supreme Court in specific scenarios. And hence, using this particular power, the President consulted regarding the uh, powers of the Chief Justice of India to recommend uh, uh, to recommend uh, to the president regarding the appointments, elevations, etc. And hence, in this particular case, also it was decided that the Chief Justice of India will not act independently. Rather, he will take the support of the collegium, which includes the four senior most judges. And he shall take uh, the help of uh, the two senior most judges in the case of appointments of High Court. It was in this particular case that it was decided. Now, moving on. Qualification of judges. He should be a citizen of India. He should not have held a judicial office in the territory of India for 10 years or he should have been an advocate of a high court for 10 years. Should be either of these things. Now, moving on. Okay, so the thing is that there are only two qualifications when it comes to judge of the high court. Now, tenure of judges. He holds office until he attains the age of 62 years. Any question regarding his age will be determined by the President of India in consultation with the Chief Justice of India. He can resign from office by writing to the President. He can re be removed from his office by the President on the recommendation of the Parliament. The process of impeachment of a high court judge is similar to that of a judge of the Supreme Court, which is two-thirds majority in both the houses and recommendation within the same session. He vacates his office, recommendation to the president within the same session. He vacates his office when he is appointed as a judge of the Supreme Court or when he is transferred to another high court. One more important thing is that there is a difference when it comes to qualification of judges between the Supreme Court judge and the high court judge. In the case of a Supreme Court judge, even a person who the president deems is an eminent jurist can be elevated to the position of a Supreme Court judge. While in the case of High Court, that is not possible. Eminent judges or eminent jurist advocates cannot be uh, automatically nominated to the High Court. Rather, that happens only in the case of the Supreme Court. That particular condition is not there over here. Please remember it. <sighs> Convention of the Chief Ministers. The Chief Ministers of West Bengal and Tamil Nadu have jointly proposed a Convention of Non-Center Chief Ministers. Relations between the center and the states ruled by opposition parties are strained due to Various factors. The center has taken certain steps which have annoyed the state. This has been a perpetual feature of Indian democracy where the center and the states have often had a fallout. This we will study under the topic center state relations. Morris Jones says that India represents different types of federalism. The center acts as a big brother in certain cases and the center acts as an elder brother in certain cases. When it is the same party in power in the center and in the states, then it acts as an elder brother. However, when the same party, when there are different parties which are there at the center and the states, then the center acts as a big brother. Now, the relations between the center and the states ruled by opposition parties are strained because of questions related to GST and payment of GST compensation. The center has not been able to pay the GST compensation uh, in an adequate time frame. And this has uh, you know, affected its relations with certain states. Also, the partisan behavior of central agencies. Uh, we see that there has been targeting of certain states uh, by uh, central institutions such as the Enforcement Directorate, such as the Central Bureau of Investigation. And hence, some of the states are finding it difficult. The center has moved to give itself absolute power in the transfer of IAS, IPS and Indian Forest Service officers. 
Recently, there has been a cadre policy change for the All India Services. The center has taken absolute powers when it comes to the transfer of IAS, IPS officers. The states cannot transfer them anymore. Also, governors. Now, the governors are supposed to act as a linchpin. They are supposed to act as a connecting framework between the center and the states to bring about that central perspective at different different states. However, the governors have been acting as a unit of uh, as, as a representative of the center. They have been acting as eyes and ears of the center and that is a problem. Now, the relations among states are also fraying in many instances, even as the center's moral authority to be a neutral arbiter is at a low. The center finds it difficult to be neutral because in some states it's a, it is in power. It talks about the double engine growth, which means that same when there is a, the same party in power at the states and at the central level, then it results in double engine growth. The tendency to mobilize political support in one state by berating other states though not new, seems to have acquired an additional edge with the party in the center drawing its support from northern and western regions while the opposition holds on to the southern region. So, different parts of India are under different groupings. Now, the center holds power in the northern and the western part of India while the opposition-led states are usually there in the southern region. So, this is increasing the friction between the center and the states. Now, this is not a new thing because earlier whenever there were center state issues, there have been, uh, you know, there was a Rajmanar Commission which was set up by the Tamil Nadu government in 1969. There was the Anandpur Sahib Resolution which was in 1973. Then we had the Sarkaria Committee. Now, the Sarkaria Committee actually gave several steps, measures in order to improve center state relations like setting up of an interstate council. Interstate Council. We have. Do we have a permanent Interstate Council? If yes, who is the chairperson of the Interstate Council? Uh, please uh, research about it. Article 356 should be used sparingly. Now, what is Article 356? And there is nothing but residence rule. It should be used only in utmost necessity. The institution of All India Service should be strengthened. All India services means IAS, IPS and IFOS. They should be given more autonomy. Residuary powers should remain with the parliament itself. Reason should be communicated to the state when state bills are vetoed by the president. You know that uh, state bills can be reserved by the government under article 200 and they can be vetoed by the president. So the state should be given proper reasons. Otherwise you are undermining the parliamentary democracy found at the state level. Center should have powers to deploy its armed forces. Under subject 2A of the union list, the center has powers to deploy armed forces in the states. Even without the consent of the states. However, it's desirable that the states should be consulted before deploying of army. Why? Because law and order is a subject under the state list. So center cannot take full control of the state's law and order. Procedure of consulting the chief minister in the appointment of state governor should be prescribed in the constitution itself. Currently, it is not needed. It is only an advisory uh, thing that exists. But state chief ministers are usually not uh, uh, consulted with before uh, nominating the governor at all. Governor should be allowed to complete the term of five years. This will increase their autonomy. Panchi committee recommendations. Giving a fixed term of five years to the governors and their removal by the process of impeachment. Currently, we have impeachment only for the president who can be removed with two-thirds absolute majority in the houses. Union should be extremely restrained in asserting, in asserting parliamentary supremacy in matters assigned to the states. Now, the union can still make laws on the stateless subjects under Article 249. Article 252, 253 and so on, 356, 365, all these undermine the powers of the states. So the center should be restrained in asserting parliamentary supremacy when it comes to lawmaking. It prescribes certain conditions that one should keep in mind while appointing the governors. 
what are these conditions the governor should be eminent he should be a person from outside the state he should be a detached figure and not connected with the local politics he should not be connected with the politics in the recent past however usually these are not followed to and the post of governor is actually used uh, to give uh, you know it is used as an appeasement measure for failed politicians or for bureaucrats after retiring the government should uh, be given a fixed tenure of 5 years the procedure given for impeachment of the president should, could be made applicable to the governor as well governor should insist on the chief minister proving his majority on the floor of the house what happens currently is that the governor a lot of times he doesn't talk about uh, this used to be prevailing earlier now it is not there anymore now usually the governor asks for the chief minister to prove his majority on the floor of the house only earlier the governor used to ask and come ask the chief minister to visit him with his uh, followers and hence it was left to the whim and the fancy of the governor to decide if at all the chief minister had enough numbers or not the sr bomai case guidelines should be kept in mind while deciding cases related to the president's rule now what does the sr bomai case say the sr bomai case makes it very difficult to actually impose president's rule under article 356 it says that in case of misgovernment you know when the government doesn't act in a proper manner uh, when uh, the people are not happy with policies or on the basis of corruption you know these are not the conditions under which article 356 can be deployed so sr bomai case makes it very difficult to impose article 356 interstate council should be made uh, more use of to further center state relations again interstate council a person of the interstate council would be the prime minister lasts of fever and its symptoms one of the three persons diagnosed with lasts of fever in the uk has died on february 11th the cases have been linked to travel to western african countries so this particular fever has been found in western african countries what are the western african countries Uh, please read uh, the geography of the region try to come up uh, with the rivers that flow over here the mountains in this region where is the atlas mountain now the lassa fever causing virus is found in west africa and was first discovered in 1969 in lassa nigeria spread of the fever please remember that the fever is spread by rats and is primarily found in countries in west africa which are sierra leone liberia guinea nigeria where it is endemic over here it is endemic it is found only over here a person can be infected if they come in contact with household items of food that is contaminated with the urine or feces of an infected rat it can also be spread through though rarely if a person comes in contact with a sick per- sick persons infected bodily fluids or through mucus can all this can also result in the spread of infection effects of the fever are that the death rate associated with this disease is low at around 1% only but death rate is very high when it comes to certain individuals such as pregnant women in their tri- third tri semesters hence it's a problem symptoms typically appear 1 to 3 weeks after exposure people don't usually become contagious before symptoms appear unlike covid where people can become contagious even before symptoms over here people become only uh, uh, contagious after the symptoms appear mild symptoms include slight fever fatigue weakness and headache and more serious symptoms include bleeding difficulty breathing vomiting facial swelling etc death can also occur it is very few i mean we saw that the mortality was only 1% however it can occur from 2 weeks of the onset of the symptoms as a result of multi organ failure multiple organs which are failing at the same time however one of the most important things is that this disease has a very high percentage of causing deafness a lot of people who are infected by this particular uh, disease virus are uh, seeing symptoms of some amount of deafness it need not be complete deafness partial deafness 
but this is the major outcome and this is permanent in nature and uh, that is it thank you